uh, this is called a proposal for a 29th fundamental belief. It was an article that I wrote with my friend, uh, Greg Jones, several months back. And, uh, you know, plagiarism is a time honored tradition in the Adventist culture, but I, I'm breaking that tradition today. I'm letting you know that uh, I got this idea from Greg and uh, Greg is on here today. He, I, I don't think he looks like this anymore. I think this is a picture that's been around a while. Now, now he looks <laughs> old like the rest of us, uh, but he is a brilliant uh, thinker, interesting, creative thinker. And uh, he was the one that, that came up with that, this idea. And so he and I crafted this article together. I thought it was a wonderful idea, Greg, and I thank you for it. I'm going to start by doing something that I, I don't usually do. Usually I have some questions at the end that I want people to talk about. But I'm going to start with uh, some things I want you to think about. Now, let's just be honest here. Uh, what I'm proposing here about a 29th fundamental belief, uh, which I will explain to you in a moment, is never going to happen. Uh, this this is... is uh, probably, I could say, a provocation for making people think about what it is that a church is and what a church should be and, and what it means for somebody to be a Christian. And so what I'm, I'm trying to introduce here is this idea of how much freedom do Christians have? Uh, in, in churches like ours and, and, and some others, uh, Christians often feel like they are fairly restricted in what they can think and, and, and do. Uh, and so, as I explained in the piece, there are people who sort of go out, uh, to, who, who sort of either live under tension within, within the church uh, because the fact is that Christians, that, that Christian churches seem to require a lot of structure. So we have these two differences. We have Christians who, in my opinion, should have some freedom to believe and to do what is important, what is, is uh, significant to them. Uh, what what they're they're convicted about, but struck churches are always pulling in the direction in the direction of imposing structure, and and very often if you you don't have to scratch very deep to see why churches want that structure, they want it because it helps the organization to survive. It, it they they want it because it keeps people sort of under a. Uh, under pressure, under a, 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 a cloud of obligation. Uh, if you, for example, change the notion about the importance of giving money to the church, that impacts a lot of people, including people like me who work for the church. If, if you say, for example, that, uh, yeah, how much you give to the church is just whatever you want to give. Uh, it's much better for the organization to say what you, you must give 10% of your money to the church. So as I say, you don't sometimes you don't have to scratch very deep to see how this works and why churches need the structure and the rules that they have. But the question that comes up here, and so this is, this is a bit of, a, of an intellectual exercise because I don't think this is ever going to happen. I think we are stuck with a creedal church. And by the way, make no mistake, our 28 fundamental beliefs are a creed. And I don't care how many times people say, no, we Adventists don't have a creed. Yes, they function as a creed. That's precisely what they do. The question is, how do we mediate between freedom and structure? And uh, if you think about it a little bit, this is probably something that is true of all organizations, not just churches. Uh, that that mediation, that that crossover between uh, 
structure and freedom. Let me explain what the proposed 29th fundamental belief is. The proposed 29th fundamental belief is that people can embrace or reject, accept or reject any one or more of the first 28 and still remain loved and active members of our community as long as they are kind, respectful of others' feelings and opinions, and behave toward others according to Christian principles. You know, work on that a little bit in, in, in your minds and, and think about it and, and, and see where that seems to be going for you. Uh, later on, I'm going to refer to the discussion that started up in the, uh, on our, our Facebook page about this. Um, some of the, the comments were very interesting. Now, I should, I should kind of bring some of you in here and ask if, if you have any more fundamental beliefs that you find problematic. I listed six of them, and I tried to find some that were on both sides of uh, both the conservative and liberal. Uh, a lot of evangelical Adventists, as uh, this was... was Greg's, something Greg pointed out to me, are going to have a lot of trouble with that number 24, Christ Ministry of the Heavenly Sanctuary, for good reasons. Uh, it is a unique Adventist doctrine, and it does have some, does raise some concerns. Uh, you, of course, know scientific-minded people who have a lot of trouble with number six, creation by fiat in six literal days. And very often, that is accompanied by a short chronology. Uh, you know, the, the earth was created 6,000 years ago based on Usher's chronology, that sort of thing. People struggle with that. Uh, a lot of more liberal Seventh-day Adventists struggle with number 23, uh, the, that the only valid marriage is between a man and a woman. And uh, along with that, uh, traditionally, Adventists have used to teach, uh, this is not being enforced anymore, but that there is no divorce, or if there is a divorce, you can never remarry. Uh, I have heard conservative people be very concerned about number 14. And uh, th this puzzles both liberals and conservatives. Differences between, list several things, but one of them is male and female ought not to affect roles in which we serve and be served. Now, doesn't that open the way for women's ordination? And uh, that's what the liberal side asks. And the conservative, conservative side makes the same accusation. You, you shouldn't be that open about the differences, that the differences between male and female uh, ought not to affect roles. So they say, yes, it does affect roles. We have different roles, different purposes. Uh, there is, going back in Adventist history, a lot of people don't realize this, but there is a long history of challenging the Trinity in the Seventh Adventist Church. Uh, James White was a Unitarian. Uh, several of the other founders were Unitarians. They did not like the Trinity. Uh, in fact, when Ellen White included uh, lessons about the Trinity in some of her books, she got great pushback from some of the brethren. But it was after she began to embrace the concept of the Trinity that uh, it, that that began to change. And now we wouldn't think very much of teaching the Trinity, except that a new group of conservative Seventh Adventists have brought back the Unitarian idea that God is not a Trinity. Uh, there are people who uh, liberals who would challenge the idea that uh, we do not use alcohol. I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime, but it is absolutely true. So those are some problematic fundamental beliefs. And when we get to the discussion, probably some of you can, can uh, bring some of those things up. We said in our article, it seems unjust to dismiss questioners of some part of this faith as if they have no place among the people of whom Ellen White said, we have many lessons to learn and many, many to unlearn. God and heaven alone are infallible. Those who think that they will never have to give up a cherished view 
never have occasion to change an opinion, will be disappointed. As long as we hold to our own ideas and opinions with determined persistency, we cannot have the unity for which Christ prayed. To me, that is a clear statement of a church that is bonded by the Holy Spirit and not by a creed. Because if our ideas can be changed, we cannot all hold to them uh, perfectly and without objection. Uh, I will point out a little bit later, somebody said, uh, when I was baptized, there were a certain number of fundamental beliefs and baptismal vows. Uh, she said, since that happened, they've added probably six since I was a child and there've been many more added since then. Uh, who am I as an Adventist? If I signed up under one set of beliefs, who am I now um, since they've been tweaked and changed? We'll talk about that too. Keep that in mind as part of our discussion. Uh, we put together five arguments. <laughs> Argument number one, and, and to me, this is, this is a, probably the, the foundational argument. It admits what is already the case. That is, that certain people do not believe, that, that a lot of people do not believe certain of the fundamental beliefs. I have, I have talked to pastors, I've talked to lay people, uh, very few people that I've talked to said, oh yeah, every one of them is perfect. I subscribe to all of them, I keep all of them. Most people would say, yeah, I got a little trouble with this one or that one. Uh, and, and yet they're still faithful and good members of the community. Fundamental belief 29 would acknowledge the agnosticism that a great many have about some of these points. To admit that moves our questions out of the shadows where they can't be discussed into the open for examination. It erases the shame of analytical thinking and allows all to feel part of the body rather than like hypocrites hidden in plain sight. I love that, that whole idea. To me, that is the foundation. I think what it says is that we are bonded as a church, not on the basis of a set of truths. We are bonded as a church by the Holy Spirit uh, and uh, by love for one another. And it does not serve us well to have people hiding and be hypocrites uh, that honesty is, is preferable. Number two, and here I spell that, what I just explained out more clearly, it defines that the church has a community, not a creed. It is who we are together, not merely what doctrines we hold that make us a church. Paul acknowledges this, that in his many metaphors, that we are a building of many parts with Christ as a cornerstone, a body of many parts with Christ as the head. And he says so very clearly, he says, not all of the parts do the same thing. We've taken this as sort of a functional uh, thing. You know, there's people who can play the piano and people who can speak and people who can only sweep the floor. And we've taken it that way, but it has to go deeper than that. Uh, the body of many parts means that everybody will not agree at the same time. And I love this passage. I, w when I was uh, researching this, I came up with this passage from John Wesley. I'm just going to read it all because I love it so much. My belief is no rule for another. I ask not, therefore, of him with whom I would unite in love. Are you of my church, of my congregation? Do you receive the same form of church government and allow the same church officers with me? Do you join in the same form of prayer wherein I worship God? I inquire not, do you receive the supper of the Lord in the same posture and manner that I do? Nor whether in the administration of baptism, you agree with me at admitting sureties for the baptized in the manner of administering it or the age of those to whom it should be administered. Nay, I ask not of you, as clear as I am in my own mind, whether you allow baptism in the Lord's Supper at all. Let all of these things stand by. We will talk of them, if needed, be at a more convenient season. My only question at present is this, is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart? Okay, I love that. Uh, that is uh, something that should be remembered, I think. This is a, a fantastic quote. 
and thank you, James, I agree with you. It is a grand quote. Argument number three, the church founders never intended us to be based on a statement, on statements of belief. They were terrified of creeds because they saw their church developing very rapidly. They saw new ideas. They had, they had watched as some of these ideas developed around them. Uh, they had seen ideas that were new come from the, the, the pen and the visions of Ellen White, for example. Uh, they had seen scholars studying the scripture and coming up with ideas that had, hadn't been in the community discussion before, but all of a sudden there they were and people heard them and said, yes, I like that. That fits what we want to believe. And so uh, White and Lothborough and many of the others were terrified lest people set up creeds. And this is a, a straight quotation from, from James White. I take the ground that creeds or fundamental beliefs stand in a direct opposition to the gifts by which he means the Holy Spirit. Oh, I said gifts, gifts should be. Making a creed is setting the stakes and barring up the way to all future advancement. The Bible is our creed. We reject everything in the form of a human creed. We take the Bible and the gifts of the spirit, embracing the faith that thus the Lord will teach us from time to time. And I will suggest to you that my 29th fundamental belief would probably be embraced by James White, even though it would be deeply opposed by everybody in his office in the General Conference now. Argument number four, it sets congregations free to follow the spirit. I was uh, talking to a friend the other day and I was telling them about when uh, we go to Southern California, uh, there's a church near where we stay, where we have stayed, that uh, is an extremely conservative Adventist church. So nice church, nice people, uh, but they would be very happy to listen to Doug Batchelor sermons and uh, uh, very con politically conservative. Uh, week after week, they would talk about um, uh, dangers uh, that are coming upon us because of Jesus' soon return, uh, dangers of persecution, those sorts of things. Just a few miles away is another church, and this is the one I attend that has a high church liturgical service with readings and creeds and a Sabbath school class that is run specifically for LGBTQ plus members. Now, personally, I think that's great. Uh, I would like churches, congregations to have the freedom to find their place along a fairly broad spectrum. And number 29 pitches a broad tent covering traditional Seventh Avenue congregations as well as those that are progressive. So the broad churches can be as broad as they want to be while others can divine themselves as narrowly as makes their members com comfortable. But neither church needs to apologize for taking a different stance on some issue than the general conference leaders do, or than a general conference in session has voted. And finally, argument number five. And, and I think this is very important. You know, I'm a lifelong pastor. I studied through most of my my education at uh, Seventh Avenue schools under true blue Seventh Avenue teachers. Uh, I grew up on fifth generation in the Seventh Avenue church. Uh, I grew up in a very conservative family in a very conservative church. I am surrounded by family members who are pastors and friends who are pastors. Uh, I am, in spite of my differences with some of these things, 
deeply appreciative of who we are in our history. I, I don't reject uh, the hard work that has gone in to understanding who we are uh, by people like uh, some of my famous favorite professors like Dr. Guy or Dr. Garrity and uh, some of these wonderful, wonderful, Dr. Johnston, some of these wonderful people who I just so deeply respect. And so this is important for me to say. Uh, this is why Greg and I did not come saying, let's reject all of the 20, 28 fundamental beliefs. What we're saying is adding this 29th fundamental belief wouldn't specifically repudiate anything Adventists believe or have believed. It does not ignore the historical basis for, nor the subsequent hard theological work that has gone into crafting these teachings. It discards nothing. It merely gives people permission not to pretend they should believe, they believe what they don't believe. Uh, you do not have to be a hypocrite in my 29th Fundamental Belief Church. You can bring up your differences as long as you do it in Christian kindness. Adventists remain as believers in a present truth. Now, let's remember, how many times have we used the word present truth? One of our first magazines was called Present Truth. We have spoken of present truth, and, and, and lest you forget, present truth meant that God was teaching us as we go along and that we can evolve with the times. And saying that we have 28 spikes driven into the ground, 28 posts that hold up the tent, and we can never move them or remove them or adjust them in any way. Uh, well, in the first place, that's not true because we have adjusted them many times. But to say that you have to, if you're going to be a Seventh-day Adventist, you have to hold to what we have now is not present truth. Present truth means we ought to be open to learning more or to gently setting aside what we have ceased to find truthful. Now, I went to the, uh, I thought just to sort of bring this to some discussion, and, and this is the place where you can begin to raise your hands if you want to. Um, I went to the discussion that was on the website. I didn't put any names in here, but I figured that I could quote some of your comments uh, that people had put up on the website. And so I'm going to quote some of those comments, and, and maybe some of this will give you ideas for questions or comments you want to ask. Uh, here's what some, one person said on, on the comments. John did not quiz those he baptized at the Jordan, not even Jesus. Isn't this between the individual and God working out our own salvation? And can't we just support one another along the journey instead of using this measurement as a judgment? Now, this, this is interesting because I don't know about you. It'd be interesting to know if any of you have ever had this happen. Uh, even as a pastor, I, I have been accused of not being orthodox enough. But I don't think I've ever had anybody sit me down and say, okay, here's 28 beliefs. Let me read through each of them, and I want you to declare that you believe each of these perfectly as it is written. Well, in the first place, it's hard to know. Uh, you know there's always different ways of, of, of understanding things. Well, and this leads to the next comment I have here. Uh, if one was baptized 50 years ago and still believes the baptismal vows when they were baptized, what happens with the tweaking that has taken place since? Are you still a Seventh-day Adventist? You can't change the rules in the middle of the game. I'm going to have a little bit more to say about this in a moment. Uh, everyone gets to decide what they want to believe or what is true. Why would a church say its beliefs are optional? If Seventh-day Adventists don't see it the way you do it, it bothers you, move on. This is the uh, love it or leave it view, uh, believe or leave. And uh, quite, a, quite a few people in the discussion express this. They say, you either accept it all or get out of here. We don't need you. Uh, it dries up the soul when people who apparently have no choice stay in a group they don't believe in or truly identify with. 
They languish for years, even decades, putting up with a face while dying inside just to belong. Now, this was somebody who hated my proposal, but I thought in the sort of way they made my point. Uh, and what I want to say is you get to stay and you don't have to be a hypocrite. You don't have to so uh, hide inside or die inside. You can stay and be a, an unbeliever in some of these things, as long as you behave as a Christian. This was an interesting little exchange. Can a Catholic be a Catholic without believing Mary as mediatrix or a Buddhist without embracing reincarnation? Is a Muslim still a Muslim if he rejects Mohammed? Can a Seventh-day Adventist be called one if he rejects the Sabbath or the Second Coming? Well, this next piece then was a response to it. The New Testament church did not teach propositional doctrines in the way the modern Protestant slash Adventist church does. Growth in grace wasn't about assent to a list of doctrines in the New Testament, but it was about living out the self-giving love of the Messiah as the evidence of faith in allegiance to him. That should be our point of comparison, not how the Catholic church regards Mary. The idea of 28 fundamental propositional doctrines that function as an extended creed is beyond anything that defined the parameters of belonging and even maturity in the New Testament church. Now, you'll notice my question at the top of each of these is, can the church survive this? So that's why I'm bringing in these various points of view. Again, growth in Jesus is about a relationship, not a doctrine or creed. And this person suggests that doctrine actually stymies spiritual growth when we whack people over the head with it. Now, this next one uh, I took very seriously. Um, I, I'm not going to tell you that it was Smuts Van Royen who wrote it, so you don't know who wrote it. So I, I, can't, I can't tell you that. Uh, I, want to, I want to keep his identity secret. But uh, he wrote, the, uh, the, this, this comment says, I think the proposal is fascinating, but it asks for too much from us and seems wholly impractical. So his proposal would be to divide the doctrines into different sections. Section one, non-negotiable, such as a belief in God, the Bible, the life of Christ. Section two, identity items such as the Sabbath, the Great Controversy, the Second Coming, social justice. I, I wasn't sure that most Adventists would put social justice as an identity item smuts, but maybe they do. Uh, second, section three, negotiables, such as eating pork, lifestyle stuff, etc. Right now, all our beliefs have the same importance. Isn't belief in Jesus more important than not going to movies? There's nothing fundamental about bacon or lipstick. Ideas have consequences. And I thought this was an interesting line here at the end. Uh, so does having no ideas. Hmm. Uh, so much this, this just raised all kinds of questions for me. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the Puritan idea of the halfway covenant uh, in a moment, which I think is a pretty fascinating way of looking at this. Uh, but I think the first thing that would would be problematic is what do you put in sections one, two, and three? I think the, that's where the fight would move. I think there are a lot of people who would say that uh, bacon and lipstick are just as important as Jesus. A lot of Adventists would. Uh, so that that's an interesting thing for us to talk about. Uh, here again, this is something I had just pointed out in, I, I think, argument number four. The Adventist pioneers rejected a creed in requiring people to sign on to every point as a condition for baptism or employment. Uh, furthermore, the number of fundamental beliefs have grown over my time, but at least by at least 12, over time, by at least 12, about six in my own lifetime. And then this person added this, somebody had said, well, I actually have these two turn around. Let me go to the bottom one. The argument that one should not join the church if he doesn't agree with all 28 is basically unenforceable in practice. Matthew 28 says, teaching them to observe all things, uh, but enforcement or obedience is personal between a person and God. I had a pastoral colleague 
who uh, lived in a parsonage. And of course, this was back in the parsonage days. You guys, some of you who are pastors may have remembered this in some of these small towns. It was actually a pretty good idea because nobody was gonna buy a house in some of these small towns, but the local people would take care of the parsonage. And so they had keys to the parsonage and uh, he discovered that the local people from the church would come in and check his refrigerator to see if he had any Coca-Cola or any meat in it. Uh, so there was a sense of, I'm trying to enforce that our pastor is uh, doing uh, what I believe an Adventist should do. Most of the time though, I've never tried to enforce obedience on people. I had church members who I was pretty sure had did things that probably wouldn't be uh, orthodox. I didn't try to enforce it on them. But uh, this person who actually comes from the general conference uh, wrote this. She said, the issue is, is indeed enforcement from the viewpoint of many administrators. She said, there recently has been resurrected a form of Fulkenberg's proposal to require employees, especially in education, with particular attention to those teaching at seminaries, to sign what amounts to a loyalty oath. Refusal would either disqualify them from teaching at all, or at least forbid religious profession, professors from teaching pastors in training. Uh, somebody brought this back up again. This is, again, James White's idea. Why not just go back to the Bible as the only creed? The fundamental beliefs, 20 fundamental beliefs, were problematic from day one. Now, there was one uh, commenter on there who found not just my idea, but me personally objectionable for bringing this up. Uh, Lauren's premise to reject these biblical expressions of love to God is self-serving and pernicious and obliter obliterates the essence of what it is to be a Seventh Adventist in comparison with other faith, faith groups. And here's an argument that I have heard many times. Uh, if all that's left is the commonality with other Christians, then the uniqueness of the Seventh Adventist message is diluted to insignificance and oblivion. Uh, this is this is fascinating. I've heard many times. I, I had uh, I told you this story. I think maybe a week or two ago, uh, when somebody said to me, uh, "You keep preaching Jesus, Jesus, Jesus." I'm so tired of that. And I said, "What's wrong with preaching Jesus?" She said, "Any church can preach Jesus. We're supposed to be preaching Seventh Adventism." Uh, Lauren Seibel's proposition appears loving and accepting on face value, but it essentially degrades the individual to substitute his own values with belonging and live a lie that drains the soul. Belonging and identifying with a group is central to one's existence. That's why it's admirable for a person to leave one's church for another when they discover new truths. They're essentially risking their identity for their faith, a commendable act. In other words, and this was a person who was not objecting to the, to, to, to the, uh, fundamental beliefs as they are. Uh, but again, it's believe it or leave it. If you don't believe it completely, get out of here. It's more honest. It's actually commendable for you to leave. Now, can the church survive this? I, I tried to craft an answer to this. And I, I say I because uh, this was part of the essay that I wrote, Greg. I, I think I don't believe that, that you contributed this part of it. Congregations, as the holders of membership, are the fundamental building block of our denomination. They, not the denom denomination, hold people accountable to the community. As long as we use our denominational name and study the Bible, neither the history nor the ethos of the Seventh Adventist Church nor the basics of Christianity will go away. We will remain believer who speak of Jesus' return and worship on the Saturday Sabbath. So I, I would counter those who say, oh, now it's just all going to fall apart. It's going to atomize. It's going to disappear. No, the fundamental building block of the church is membership in your congregation. The uh, congregation I mentioned to you in Southern California that is very, very conservative is not going to allow a Lauren Seibel to be a member. Uh, the other congregation that has a gay Sabbath school class and has a liturgical service uh, would, 
I believe, welcome me quite fine. And in fact, I have transferred my membership to one of those churches down in Southern California because it was one that I felt I could be very comfortable at. Uh, thank you, uh, Todd Leonard and, uh, and uh, Leif Lind. So could the church survive it? I would say, practically speaking, no. We will not be this kind of church anytime soon. Uh, we, we cannot be this kind of the church. It is the nature of organizations as they mature to tighten up and try to have more control, even though in a sense they have less control uh, because they believe that they are putting the net around everybody, but everybody is actually out in their own space. But can the organization reverse this? I don't believe they can. So what are some of the things we can do? Uh, we could have, uh, like uh, Smut suggested, we could have several levels of members. We could have those who believe in level one, level two, and le level three. And someone actually had suggested this. We could have associate members. Uh, some others have said something similar. They said, uh, just come to church. Don't be a member. Just, just show up. You can be here. Uh, others have said, uh, just go be a member of another church. You don't have to be a Seventh Adventist to be saved. I think some Seventh Adventists would argue with that, but uh, that's a way of doing it. Uh, I was thinking about the uh, halfway covenant. I don't know if you're aware of the halfway covenant. Uh, this is something that happened in the Puritan church of, uh, I think, around uh, 16 late 1600s for about five years, the, half, the, the Puritan church in New England. Uh, here's, what, here's what it amount, amounted to. Uh, in order to be a member of the Puritan church, you had to show evidence of having a spiritual experience. And it was that spiritual experience at this time was somewhat charismatic. You had to uh, fall down and uh, you know, foam at the mouth and, and have a real I don't know that they were speaking in tongues, but you had to have some kind of experience that convinced the elders that God had really come into your life and touched you. And it turned out there was a whole generation of young people who didn't have those, that, that experience anymore. They were there on a sort of intellectual basis. Uh, this is what we believe. This is where we grew up. Uh, this is the, the, the uh, ideas that that we hold to, and we want our children to be baptized in the church. Well, the halfway covenant said, yes, we'll let you be baptized, but you will have no other privileges in the church other than that. Uh, you cannot take communion, for example. And uh, maybe one of you church historians can correct me. We often say that the Puritans set aside all of the sacraments. My, memory. I know they set aside the sacrament of marriage and some of the others because they regarded the wedding ring as being a sign of the sacrament, and that's why it was set aside. But I do believe that the, the Puritans continued to believe that both baptism and the Lord's Supper were sacraments. Somebody may be able to correct me on that, but I think I'm right about that. I think they reduced the sacraments from seven to two. Uh, so halfway covenant, maybe we could have a halfway covenant. Uh, believe it or leave it. And you heard several people expressing that idea. Uh, either you love it all or get out. Uh, there is an old country song that said uh, about America. If you don't love it, leave it. Let this song I'm singing be a warning. If you're walking, if you're running down my country, you're walking on the fighting side of me. Uh, so believe it or leave it. And then there's the idea that uh, keep things as they are. If you have your doubts, shut up and keep your doubts to yourself and don't, don't bother me with it. Uh, just leave your hypocrisy in the background. I am frankly, personally offended by the notion that what makes me a member of this church or any other church is a list of doctrines that somebody else assembled somewhere else. 
by the process of getting together and voting on them, that I have to subscribe to what God thinks, not on the, the basis of my God-given understanding or what the Holy Spirit convicts me of, but by what Ted Wilson and his group of people have presented to a large group of people all over the world and voted. That takes me right back to the early church fathers and the early church councils. And that is not the kind of Christian I am. The kind of Christian I am is that I believe in the Jesus of the gospels. And I am frankly offended by your telling me that what makes me a member of a community is not my bonding together in love and mutual respect for you, but what makes me a member of the community is that I have to believe a list of things, whether I believe them or not. Maybe I believe all, all 28 of them. That's not the issue. The issue is that's not what makes me a Christian. And neither does it, is that what makes me a member of the community. And uh, that's where I stand uh, to, to quote Martha, Martin Luther, here I stand, I can do no other. I, uh, I feel that way about my own Christianity. And I feel that way about the faith and the belonging of my church members that I had through the years. I did not kick people out. I did not read 28 fundamentals to them and ask them to believe them. Uh, and uh, that's where I stand. I will start with Carmen Seibold. She's the first one to raise her hand. Speaker, and then uh, Smuts, Richard Myers, Arthur Sabanda, and uh, I hope others will join in. I didn't realize I was the first one, my goodness. Yes. Um, whenever I hear or read insistence that being an SDA requires affirming all the fundamental beliefs, it raises a particular concern for me um, given the fact that the list of beliefs grows and the individual beliefs get edited, um, something that's happened several times since my baptism. And it's not about the particular changes that I'm concerned about or whether I agree with them or not. It's this. This requirement means that upon joining the church, one commits not only to the current beliefs, but also to any possible future changes. Again, this is not about the details of those changes, but the commitment that one will accept the changes. So it turns one's affirmation upon joining into a commitment that in future, whatever the church votes will be one's beliefs as well. And it seems to me that those are very different theological commitments. One is to, these are the beliefs that we have when we let you join. The other is a commitment, you will believe whatever this church votes. Yes. <clears throat> well, I, I will let others join in on the discussion too. I think that that's, that is a, an extraordinarily good objection. I'm frankly offended by the notion that uh, people, that, that my belonging to this group depends on what a group of people vote. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, I cannot, I cannot accept it. Uh, my belonging to this group, I have, I have evolved a great deal since I took my baptismal vows. I haven't felt the need to stand up at every, at every opportunity and say, Here's what I don't believe anymore, everybody. But uh, I have been as blunt as I can, particularly in my retirement, in helping people to see that some of our beliefs, and I'll, I'll, I'll just say this bluntly, some of our beliefs are cruel. Some of them are unkind. Uh, some of them are, most of them are unenforceable, but some of them, the, the way we have spread fear about the second coming has been just plain unkind to people cruel in many cases. And, and I stand against that publicly. You know, I had the same thought, Carmen, that um, you did about 
signing on with a group. And it, it just makes you wonder that each time there's a change of the fundamental beliefs, does it open the door to have a church meeting where you then require people to agree with the new fundamental belief or there's a purging in the church? Uh, I just don't see any support in the Bible for the church being an enforcement body. And I could stand corrected on this, but I just don't think that's what the role of the church is. It seems to me that it's to encourage members, to encourage your walk with Christ. Um, you know, I think believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The question is, is church membership something different than salvation? I mean, are there people who don't care so much about salvation, but they're more worried about being a member of this club or a member of this group called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I actually had a relative who said one time, well, I may not be a very good Christian, but I'm a good Seventh-day Adventist. And it was very puzzling to me. It's like, what's the point of that? But just a thought. I think Smuts had his hand up next. Smuts, will you share your thoughts with us? I'm going to ask someone else to unmute because I'm struggling here. Dan's put us on a generator, but we got a message from PG&E saying we won't have power for the next four hours. So I'm doing what I can. Okay, I, uh, I went ahead and asked Smuts to unmute. Thank you. Mute, but con. There we go. Um, I have paid a price for not believing everything. Um, and please bear that in mind as I uh, make my comments. I think that, and I agree with you in so much, Lauren, uh, I, I, I agree, agree with your intention. <laughs> and uh, the, yeah, I agree with so much of what you say. It seems to me that this proposal of a 29th uh, fundamental is asking for permission to think for myself. It's asking for a freedom for, for the church to give me a freedom that is not the, free, not the churches to give. God has given me the freedom to think for myself. Um, and I claim that regardless of the church. I don't need a fundamental to say the church gives me the freedom to think for myself. Um, the, the, the church's function, according to Matthew, is to go and teach all nations. I recognize the, that function as legitimate, that the church is to teach. It is the believer's uh, duty to look at what the church teaches, evaluate for himself, and accept or reject uh, that which is taught. These were more noble in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures for themselves. Church teaches, I evaluate what the church says. Um, it seems to me we're speaking more about how we hold the truth than, uh, than what the truth is. Um, I want to add to this, this the comment that um, I believe in the notion of essence. Essence says that uh, there is something about a thing which if you remove, it ceases to be what it is. A chair is not its back, it's not its uh, 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 the color. A chair is an elevated platform on which you put your bottom. Remove the idea of an elevated platform and you do not have a chair. Um, there is an essence to Christianity. I would not feel free to give people the option to reject belief in God. I would not feel free to give people the option to reject 
uh, the crucifixion of Jesus and the life of Jesus. Um, those things are essence. For Adventists, the essence, I believe, is the Sabbath and um, the second coming. Um, so I, 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 I think we need to maintain the essence that this 29th, if you said you can reject any part of it, might reject what is essential, what makes Adventism Adventism. Um, finally, I, I want to say that my identity is not in conformity and that uh, I am able to interact between myself and the church and I find freedom in that. But thanks for Adventist today and what it does. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Smuts. You, you know, I take very seriously uh, everything that you say. <clears throat> I guess I would just say that in as much as uh, you say that you, you would not give people permission, that, that, that we need to be constantly evaluating our beliefs, but you would not uh, give people permission to reject certain beliefs. Uh, I guess my, my question to you is, well, what choice do you have? The fact is that uh, there are people sitting in the pews right now in every church who are uh, frankly agnostic. I have had moments in my life when I've been agnostic. You have had moments in your life when you thought, I don't know if there's anything out there. Human beings do this. Yes. We go back and forth. We, they, we sometimes believe, we sometimes don't believe. We're sometimes uh, uh, feeling very close to God. We're sometimes very angry with God. We sometimes wonder if God is there at all. So I don't know what choice you have. And I will add this too, uh, Smuts. But, as but much Lord, as the how does, how does uh, your 29th thing remove that dynamic? It lets people not have to be hypocrites and sit there being silent. Uh, I'm not a hypocrite because I think differently or reject uh, the, what, what the church uh, says. Well, let I me let, let me add. And I'm not true to myself. Let me add one more thing to you to that, then, uh, my friend, and that is the reason that I feel the necessis necessity of saying this in the the echo here. No, my hearing my my own voice. <laughs> Sorry, we're having a we're having an interaction here between Carmen's computer and my computer. And uh, right, uh, let me let me let me. That's what I wanted to add. In as much as the church smuts has taken it on themselves to say these are the twenty eight things you must believe, and we voted them as a body, and therefore you must believe them, and you must teach them, and we will if we find out that you don't believe or teach these things we will in some sense reject you. I, as a minister of the gospel and as a Christian, have the right to stand up and say, no, we're not gonna do that. I'm giving you permission in this belief to not have to be, feel trapped. And right now, smuts people do feel trapped. They feel like they're, they're keeping their doubts and their questions to themselves. They're the things that they reject, they, they push off into, a private room at the side. Uh, that to me is not a, a useful Christian community. If the church can stand up and say, uh, you must believe these things, I can stand up and say, yeah, but I'm giving you permission not to. Lauren, just one quick thing, I'm sorry to. Uh, you okay. mentioned the local church. Uh, the local church is our protection. When the General Conference um, said to the Andrews University Church, we want you to remove Ch Smuts's membership because he doesn't believe such and such, the local church there voted and re replied to the GC, church membership is a matter of the local church. We are not disfellowshipping Smuts. Praise the Lord. Yeah.
anyway, and I, you're and right. I made that anyway. statement at the end of my presentation, Smuts. I hope you noticed that. I know that. Love that, you. That was my, but but yeah, no, I, I, I disagree with you. I, I just flat out disagree with you because of the fact that the, the General Conference has tried to define us this way. It insists on defining us this way. You can be you can be ever so proud and angry and hurtful against people, but if you believe those 28 beliefs, somehow that, that gives you a pass. And I do not see it that way. I don't see any reason for us to continue to enforce those things upon people. Uh, Gina, I think I, I've, uh, I've scolded my friend Smuts Van Royen long enough here. So, uh, and, <laughs> and I, I, I love him fiercely. Gina, are you there? Gina's having trouble. So I'm gonna go on and, and say, Richard, uh, you're, you're up. Well, I certainly didn't anticipate my relatively lo-fi intellect following someone like uh, the intellectual and spiritual giant of Smuts Van Royen, but uh, here goes. Just consider my comments as from the ordinary Joe in the pew. When I read the article, it uh, kind of struck me as maybe being divine comedy or spiritual stand-up or possibly a call for an insurrection. Uh, and I, I, my question is, that, as a practical matter, you know, can the fundamentalist drift of our uh, church hierarchy be redirected? And uh, I think my answer is kind of the same as yours, Lauren. I'm really wondering. I've been in this church now for about 70 some years. And I'll be honest, in all that time, I found one church where I felt comfortable, just one. I think maybe it's time to start over to build a new movement on the crumbling foundation of institutional Adventism. I think there's a need for new pioneers who are leading a movement and pointing the pathway to the cross. We need to recapture fundamental Christianity. And to do that, I think we're gonna to have to deconstruct the 28 fundamentals. I'd like to just in closing share a statement that Ellen White made in the year 1892. She's much maligned, but to me, this is great, great wisdom for our time. She said, we cannot take a position that the unity of the church consists in viewing every text of scripture in the very same light. The church may pass resolution upon resolution to put down all disagreements of opinion, but we cannot force the mind and the will and thus root out disagreement. Nothing can perfect unity in the church but the spirit of Christ-like forbearance. That's from Manuscript 24 in 1892. And I think that's a profound statement. Richard, thank you for that. I, I, I did not remember that passage and it, it is indeed profound. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And I said at the very beginning that you, you said it sounds a little <laughs> bit like, a, like comedy and, and perhaps there is, perhaps it ends up being that way. Uh, I, I meant it to be provocative, and you, you, you know that, you correctly identified that. And I also realized that the church is too far down the, its road to ever really take it seriously. Um, but at the same time, I, I feel the need to say it, because the church has, I, and I don't want to, I don't want to back off to uh, the, the three-part level of uh, what's important and what isn't important. I don't want to, at this point, give the denomination that kind of power. I want to say, as a Seventh-day Adventist, community is bonded by something other than 28 beliefs that we share in common. But thank you for that so much, Richard. I, I really like that. I'm going to lower your hand. I, I still have not seen Gina here. I... I'm here. Oh, Gina, OK. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm back. I, I wasn't sure <laughs> you if you were here I, or not, I so I, I kind of took over. No, that's fine. I just wanted to respond to what Richard just said. Um, the idea that the church uh, kind of needs to have new pioneers and some new blood into it. And contrast that to the love it or leave it sentiment that was expressed in some of the reactions to your article. Mm 
-hmm. Because I think that we are deceiving ourselves if we don't acknowledge that the Adventist church is more than a, a statement of fundamental beliefs. There is an entire culture that goes with the Adventist church. And I think there are many people who live within that culture. And if they left the church, they would just be at sea. They would have no nothing to anchor to. So I, I think that's another reason why we have to allow for um, breadth of thought. I'm going to take a position that's going to going to place a target on my back from all of you from one direction or the other. Okay, I'd like to suggest a middle ground. Part of the problem we're having is we conflated church membership and salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, we as a church have traditionally done that based on our remnant theology, and we treated the church as an ark. If you were in it, you're saved, and if you're not in it, you're lost. And uh, be, so a lot of people want to hold on to that church membership, and also because of the social relationships in the church that we're loath to lose. But any organization needs to have boundaries that define it. If you don't have those boundaries, you wouldn't have an organization. It would cease to exist. So, and those, even though those and those boundaries have to be constantly in flux. Every organization, and here I'll take a slight issue with Lauren's position. Any organization has a right to redefine its boundaries, and then its members have a right to decide if they want to be a part of it. That doesn't make them saved or lost, good or bad. It just means that that the organization is protecting what defines it. And again, as I said a minute ago, our remnant theology has turned the church into an ark where if you're in it, you're saved, and if you're out, it, out of it, you're lost. That means that, first of all, we view those in other churches as somehow lost rather than accepting them as brothers and sisters, and particularly those people who choose to leave and start fellowshipping with a church that's not a Seventh-day Adventist church. With other groups of people, we, we view them as somehow apostatizing, rather than realizing they're finding a group of people that, um, that they can relate to. Ellen White originally said there were seven things that defined what a Seventh-day Adventist was. She called them the fundamentals. Everything else, she said, falls outside that purview. Those were the basic boundaries of what defined what a Seventh-day Adventist was. That's why the last church I pastored decided that what Ellen White defined as those boundaries, even though they might be defined differently in different times, would be what we would ask anyone wishing to join our church to be to subscribe to. That doesn't mean that they were saved. It just meant that they wanted to be a part of this group. We, we didn't do the 28 fundamental beliefs because we've added to those, but those seven basic things, it seems like Smuts touched on, you know, touched on some of those. There was the second coming. There was the Sabbath, the law of God, however you want to define that. There was, let's see, uh, the judgment again, however you want to define that. And I think, I think we've, we're kind of undergoing a revolutionary understanding of what that means. By the way, I'll do some shameless self-promotion here and say a recent book uh, published on the book of Revelation called The Revelation by Dan Appel and available on Amazon, talks about the judgment and how that we can review it totally differently and still believe in a pre-advent judgment. There, again, there are certain basics. Uh, everything else is a belief. I mean, a, a, yeah, a, a teaching. Whether or not you drink wine is, should not be a fundamental belief. Ellen, wasn't for Ellen White. Whether you eat pork in fact, Ellen White said for a long time that unclean meat should not be a test of fellowship in the Adventist church. Uh, uh, there are a number of other things that we've accrued that, that we need to go back to the basics and then say, if you, if, you, if you agree with those, I'm glad to be a part of the same group with you. If not, I'll honor you wherever you're at. And like I said, now I know I have some of you shooting at me from both directions. I'm a big boy. Uh, it won't be the first time. Thank you. Well, Dan, I will tell right, you that here in, in this group, we, don't, we, we tend not to shoot at people. <laughs> that, that's kind of one of the ways that we define ourselves is that we're non-shooters. <laughs> Does that mean I can't keep my concealed weapons permit? You, uh, you, you are free to, 
to see things uh, as you like. Uh, I would just suggest I, I have a I have a friend who's a, an old fashioned Episcopalian pastor. Uh, by old fashioned, I mean uh, he's one of those people who who uh, kind of believes in the 1929 prayer book, and and his belief is that. Uh, the early councils of the church were as inspired as the, uh, the Bible. And so when uh, the early council of the church said that God was three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when they crafted the uh, Nicene Creed and uh, other things, uh, that those things were uh, as important and as inspired to the church as uh, the Bible was. And uh, I guess that's fine. And you're suggesting that Ellen White's list of what was important to the church should be considered, continued to be used. And I guess that's okay. Uh, I just don't see the necessity for quite as much control as you do, I guess. Uh, oh, don't, I, Lauren, if I could just interrupt you for a second, is there a difference between control and saying, this is what defines us. And, and it doesn't make it bad or good. It doesn't make you saved or lost doesn't make you a Christian. Um, it's just it's just what defines this particular group. And and uh, 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 we need something that defines us that is a little bit definitive. You can't just say, well, you got to believe in Jesus, because how, how are you gonna how are you gonna define that? And so again, there's boundaries. Are we discovered in the psychological world. Boundaries are important and they're healthy, as long as they're as long as they're administered graciously, kindly, and lovingly. Which I think we would all agree, the current administration uh, at the head of our church probably is not doing a good job of doing. Exactly, and I was going to say to you, Dan, that uh, it, you 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 are asking us to still accept some items of a creed, uh, but change the entire psychology around it. Uh, and I, I'm not sure we're capable of that okay. uh, from the very top. And that's why I come back to the congregation thing again. As a, as a pastor, uh, I, I'm a leader and my congregation gets to decide what kind of heretics get to be members. And I hope they decide everybody, every heretic gets to be a member because all of us are heretics in one way or the other. Thank you, Dan. Uh, you, you, you always stimulate me. Um, I, I think the next person. I'm going to go to Ed Zerkwitz. Lauren, if you could yeah. unmute him. Until you make me a co host, I can't unmute anybody. Ooh. So I didn't do that. Let do me that, that would be that. great. Ed, will you share your thoughts with us? And I'm just going to encourage everyone to be brief because we have quite a lot of people who have things to say this week. So, Ed, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, I think it's the application of the uh, teachings and the beliefs that's where the real problem is. And I agree with what Lauren said is top down just doesn't work. And I, I taught a class or a number of years ago, I taught classes on the 28 fundamental beliefs, you know, on a certain day of the week. And um, one thing I realized is nobody remembers any of them. I shouldn't say any of them, but I mean, how many people can stand up and say, oh, here they are, you know, it's yeah. sort of like a waste of time almost. But when you look at the church manual, I know I'm going off topic a bit, but that's where I see a lot of problems there. It's, it's a very legalistic rule focused uh, document, you know, book that um, sometimes um, needs, to, my, in my opinion, if we got rid of at least half or three quarters of the church manual, uh, you know, we would sure make our lives a lot different and easier, I believe. So, sure. Thank you for those. You know, I appreciate your thoughts, Ed. And I, I actually printed out the 28 fundamental beliefs and was surprised by some of them. My husband and I read through them last night. And at the end of a very um, bloated bit of verbiage for every fundamental belief, we would then go back to the first sentence to try to understand what they were talking about. It was very confusing. And I also went uh, on Wikipedia and found out that there are baptismal um, oaths that are different from the fundamental beliefs that have varied over time. So going back to Carmen's question, 
you know, is it your baptismal oath or is it the 28 fundamental beliefs and can the church just change them at random and you're still involved in it? It's challenging. The church manual, that's a new one on me. I don't even know what's in it, but maybe I need to. Well, let me, maybe I can comment on that a bit. And, and Ed, I think you have a really good point. Uh, when you said that, I thought of uh, somebody saying one time, this little saying that a, a camel is a beast of burden assembled by a committee. Uh, because it it has so many weird parts to it. Um, and uh, the thing that you need to realize about the church manual is that it is an example of a sort of common law being assembled over time. <laughs> Nobody ever sat down and wrote the church manual. It is a group of things being being assembled and voted into the church manual session after session after session after session and they need not necessarily go together uh, sometimes there are things in there that are from 1930 that contradict the things from 1980. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the church manual is really not that helpful in a lot of ways uh, i've always had church members and some of you who have been pastors or on church boards you've, you've seen this you you have somebody there who always every time you say something you say but the church manual says and they have their church manual with them all the time. And, and they employ the church manual similarly to the way others in doctoral questions employ the 28 fundamental beliefs. And uh, I've seen people absolutely, you know, create horrible things because the church manual says, you've got to do it this way. And so we're going to do it that way. And I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if everybody hates it. We're going to go to the church manual. Artist just says at my church, the programs and Sabbath have to comply with the church manual or the board will <laughs> stick in and stop your program. I mean, Ed, really, you're, you're absolutely right. And you make a wonderful point and I appreciate it. Very interesting. Raj Atkin, you're up next. I'm going to, I think you're unmuted at this point. Yes, yes, I am. Go uh, ahead. Let me uh, drop just a couple of ideas into this conversation. Uh, one of which I take from Acts chapter 15, which I find quite intriguing uh, in, in terms of uh, setting boundaries and giving freedom. And if you understand the story in Acts 15, you had uh, people uh, uh, from Judea who tried to impose a whole string of, of expectations of uh, Gentile converts. And the apostles got together, talked about it, and said, no, we, we, we will approach this differently. And um, here's what they wrote. Uh, I'm just going to read a couple of verses from Acts 15. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. And they listed two or three. And then they said, if you do this, you will do well, period, farewell. I think that was just that brilliant, the way they, they address this issue. So that, that's my first idea. Uh, the second one in relation to the 28 fundamentals is, would be this. What, what if we agreed on something like this? I just scribbled this while we were talking. We, as a community, are committed to being a community that seeks to keep growing in faith, in relationship, and in knowledge, it is our current understanding that the Bible teaches that and lists the, 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 the doctrines that we believe are important. But the commitment is not to the doctrines. The commitment is to being a community that keeps growing, which means we change, growing in faith, in relationships with God and with one another, and in our understanding. Uh, so those are two ideas that uh, I throw into the mix here. I, I love it's it. It's the human condition, I think, Raj, that people, uh, they almost look for opportunities to have a conflict, and it's not unique to the Adventist church. Yeah. I wish I could uh, get my, my co-writer, Greg Jones, to come in here and tell me why this, this came up in his own life, and I think uh, that would help clarify some of the, these things that we're talking about, but you're absolutely right. It, and Ed, by, uh, Raj, by the way, one of the things they asked was if they avoid uh, strangled meat or that they avoid meat offered to idols. They didn't follow that. 
Paul wrote exactly the opposite of Romans 14. He said, with idolism, I, I, an idol is nothing anyway. Don't worry too much about that. It, it, just because somebody in the market offered their meat to idols, I shouldn't stop you from eating it. And so even the things that they asked, they, the community didn't follow necessarily. So it's, a, it's an amazing story. It really is. I, I mean, uh, I've, I've heard that every time, every time I've been at a general conference committee meeting, or any kind of general conference meeting, uh, one of the brethren in particular uh, gets up and uh, preaches on Acts 15, and he gets it wrong every time. I mean, I, I've never heard so many mis -trans mis misinterpretations of Acts 15 because he always ends up making the apostles in Acts 15 being the general conference voting <laughs> every time. And he, he has never gotten past that. It, it's, it's amazing. Thank you, Raj. Carol Grady is our next participant. Carol, if you could uh, share your thoughts with us. Okay, I have a couple of fairly brief comments. Um, back when I was struggling with reconciling what the Bible seems to say about same-sex acts, the concept of present truth really stood out to me. The idea of growth in knowledge about homosexuality at that particular time, the way um, all churches as well as other religious religions were confronting this issue at the same time made me believe that God was uh, revealing new truth, present truth, and this was bolstered by learning more, by, as I learned more about homosexuality and learned to know so many wonderful gay and lesbian people. And the other comment is about belonging to the church. I'm a fourth generation Adventist. I grew up in Tacoma Park. I attended only Adventist schools, married a minister, was a missionary in Singapore for 15 years, wrote many mission stories and other articles, spent five years at the GC. In general, I was totally involved with the church. But after I learned that our son is gay and began to express my new understanding, I began to feel like I was on the outside looking in. And that's the way I feel today, except for this group which helps me feel part of the church. Oh, I am so glad, Carol. Carol, I just adore you and I admire you so much for what you've done. Your, your, your book, uh, Carol wrote a book called uh, My Son, Beloved Stranger. Uh, and I, I think the title itself is, is uh, just brilliant. And I'm so glad that you're here, Carol, and you are in fact totally accept, accepted here, uh, however you are. Uh, you, you're right. Uh, one of the places where we have failed the most is in fully accepting and embracing gay and lesbian people who are, are uh, just, I, I, it sometimes amazes me that they still want to be with us. Carol, have you ever thought that? Why, why do you still want to be here uh, when, when we have treated you so badly? Uh, but thank you, Carol. You are wonderful. Thank you. I thought, I think Carol's comment about being on the outside looking in is interesting, not just for LGBT people, but there are different places where the church draws the line. And it's not uncommon to hear Lauren and others say, you know, I'm a fourth generation Adventist, I'm a fifth generation Adventist, as if there's a pedigree to it. If you're a first generation Adventist, are you a lesser member? I grew up in a home where my mother joined the church when I was probably 12 years old and had not been Adventist to that point. My father never became Adventist, but I always felt second class. I always felt like I was on the outside looking in because I really didn't come from a traditional Adventist family. And at that point, people were talking about being a third generation Adventist as part of their pedigree. And I was, it was something that was a badge of honor with many, but it made people feel on the outside. Yeah. I'm going to go to our next person who is High Banks and ask them to uh, share their thoughts with us. Hi. Um, just, oh, uh, it's Harry. It, yeah, that guy. <laughs> Hi, Harry. <laughs> um, 
where I live here in Alaska, we have relatively few congregations. So it's not really possible to select uh, a congregation that's fully compatible with a personal belief system or uh, approach to Christianity, uh, which is my case. And um, I've be, as I've reflected over the years uh, at the, the tension between uh, personal growth and um, personal spirituality and the practice of a local congregation and the dissonance or um, misfit that happens, uh, I've sometimes wondered if, if actually in our training and teaching um, from time to time, if we've just failed in the ability to translate the eschatology into full, robust spiritual experience and uh, edification. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, we've had to, uh, parts of the church have had to rely on just enforcing rules because they don't understand relationships. They don't understand uh, the varieties of religious experience, as James um, might say. And so we just, that failure, I think, leads to this. And I think, as Ed points out, you know, we are very Gnostic in our approach. We're very intellectual. This conversation is very intellectual. We, we, make, we make a nod to, uh, yes, people need to grow and we need the church. But what I've noticed is a lot of us uh, here is we're, we're struggling against the organization and spending our time uh, uh, fighting against the organization rather than, and I would really appreciate it, Aja's approach, is rather than saying, oh, here's how we can strengthen each other. How, tell our stories of faith, tell our stories of growth. And the bottom line is throughout history, people who have made commitment to strong spiritual growth have been heretics. They've been under persecution. They don't get nice things. They get attacked. And what we need to be doing, if we really want that change that we're talking about, if we really want that, that modification, that, that new renewal, we've got to encourage each other to stand strong, not whine, not complain, not whimper, but stand strong and build that faith and become strong Christians that are able to move forward and not fight against the church, but to lead. Thank you. That's very perceptive, Harry. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know quite what to say to, about that because I, I do feel like uh, a certain amount of what we do is is fighting against the church and yet i don't feel really apologetic for that because i see the church fighting against us in many cases but i will say this harry i i'm i think our intention greg's and mine was to try to bring this local one of the things i, I haven't been able to to uh, talk greg into speaking but one of the things that greg suggested was maybe we need to have a 29 churches and that is uh or, or uh F, fb 29 churches a fundamental belief 29 churches churches that say uh hey we've added that 29th fundamental belief and with that makes us a community that's free in christ and you can come here and we're not going to criticize you uh but but my com my complaint is that I don't have that option. I can't build a 29th church here. I have, I have to find spiritual survival where I am. And, and I think we need to build a community that encourages individual strength. And, and, and I guess I, I think it's important to point out that the church has stubbed its toe or is in error, or things like that. That's important to define, but to focus on that is a problem. To, we need to focus on the personal spiritual growth from inside and how to enable and strengthen and give people a way to find a faith that's uh, sustainable 
and, and um, effective regardless of the failure. I mean, the, the church is a human organization. It's going to fail. It is failing. Mm -hmm. We've got to learn how to have faith in spite of that. No, I, I, I see your point, Harry. I really do. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. I guess I would, I would just say that, uh, that that's our intention. You know, when, when, you, do, when you do therapy, um, they make you talk about your family. And that's useful as far as it goes. But at a certain point, they say, okay, it's time for you to stand up and be yourself. Uh, but yet that family, those family things that you carry with you will probably never go away. Uh, so there's a certain amount of working through our history that we do here. And uh, as I said, my intention was to get people to think about how much freedom do Christians need, how much structure does a church need, and where do you find uh, a healthy spiritual balance in all of that. I'm going to go to Cherry Ann. Cherry Ann, if you can share your thoughts with us. I thank you and thank you, Lauren, for the article, well, Lauren and Greg, uh, because the some of the questions that you raise reflect uh, some of the things that I've been thinking about um, and battling with over the past five or so years. Um, and I have a list. I'll try to be quick. <laughs> uh, but as you, as you know, persons mentioned the the church manual and the baptismal vows. Those are things um, growing up in Jamaica that are a key part of, of being Adventist. Um, and I have even, you know, being a, a music director, had to pull out the church manual because the pastor was suggesting that there were persons who couldn't be a part of the choir um, where the church manual said they could. Um, and so I've been in those discussions. And with the baptismal votes, I think there are 13 of them. And I do remember the first time I heard they were condensed into, I think like two or three, um, and I was like, hmm, no, that's interesting, you know, how, you know, that happened. Uh, but I remember I had posted a picture, Lauren, some time ago um, that you commented on and said that, you know, I was brave because I had a particular drink in my hand. And I remember, you know, somebody coming and say, oh, but that's one of the baptismal vows, you know, how could you drink that if it's one of the vows that you, you committed to when you, when you said, you know, that you wanted to be a part of the church? Well, that's one of the things you said you wouldn't do. Uh, but I've gotten to the point of just being authentically me. Um, and, and so this idea of being a hypocrite where you don't believe all of these things, but you just don't talk about the ones that you don't agree with. Um, I've gotten to the point where I'm like, I need to be authentically who I am. And it's been quite a journey. And while I've been on that journey, there is one pastor in particular who has said to me, you know, if you want to inspire change in the church, you have to stay. You can't just say, oh, there are all these things that I don't agree with, the way that we teach them or the way that we express them. And so you're going to leave. Um, and that's a, Adventist Today has definitely helped me to remain within the fold because I'm able to share my thoughts. I'm able to hear persons with competing ideas be respectful. And that's not something I often find within the, the faith community where we can respectfully disagree and challenge ideas. Um, and so I very much appreciate um, Adventist today for that. And the, the final thing that I'll share um, on Sebi's most commented article, um, when she, she spoke about uh, the, the, the lard in, in, the, in the pie crust. Yes. I remember commenting um, on that and saying, um, I, you know, there's a friend of mine who owns a vegan restaurant and she says she's vegan accepting that she eats jerk pork. And I was like, that's a little strange <laughs> coming from somebody who owns a vegan restaurant. Um, and I said, you know what, I wanna try that. And I was like, I don't love the Lord any less. I don't give any less to causes that I support. I don't treat people any less respectfully. Um, but there are so many persons who that, like, oh, there are gonna be worms in your brain. And there are those, all these things that <laughs> comments that happen. And the persons who oftentimes I find subscribe without question to the 28 are often not the most loving. And that is definitely disappointing. Um, one final thing, uh, as, we, as I mentioned the 28, uh, because I was in university when we were discussing the 28th. 
And as a part of an Adventist youth program, they asked a few of us to, you know, do the reading, do the research and present it to the church ahead of the general conference session that was going to vote on it. And uh, the blowback that we got, you know, one of the elders had to come in and say, listen, these young people are not the ones who are suggesting this thing about growing in Christ. This is a proposal from the general conference. You know, but there are some persons who are like, oh, no, we've had 27 for so long. There are 27. How dare you propose a 28? Um, so uh, I'm not sure if there's a question in there, but I'm just very happy that this forum exists and that you put that forward. It would be wonderful to allow more of us to be authentically who we are and not be afraid to say, this is who I am. This is what I believe. This, this is a bit challenging for me. You know? That's my, that's, that, that is the intention that we have, Cherry, and I, I appreciate you very much. By the way, Cherry Ann is going to have an article in the, the magazine that's coming out next. I just uh, went through the magazine and looked at all the articles, and it was it was in there. So uh, uh, she has been writing for us. And Cherry Ann, I hope you can continue to bring other young adults in from, from the Caribbean community that you're part of uh, into our class, too. Uh, but you, you, you make me think again of what, of what Harry said, and I agree with what he said. He said, uh, we, we need to be personally strong in our relationship with the Lord. But you also helped me to realize that so many of us are struggling with the community because, and it's not because we're just angry at the community, it's because we want to be part of the community. Uh, we, we desire to be in it. And, uh, so we're trying to find ways of talking about it that, that would help us and be useful. Thank you, Cherry Ann, very much. And, and thank you for your continued writing. You're welcome. Before uh, we go to Ed Reifsneider, who is next, I just wanted to respond to one comment Cherry Ann made about the baptismal vows being narrowed down to three. I, I just wanted to point out, because I did do some quick research on this, uh, of the three uh, vows that are current baptismal vows, the second one incorporates the statement of 28 fundamental beliefs. So just putting that out there. <laughs> yeah. So Ed Reifsneider, can you share your thoughts with us? Brother yeah, uh, I want to uh, say I admire Cherry Ann's courage to say that she is going to be authentically her. I think in, in our world of Adventism, there's far too little of that. Uh, there's far too much of wearing an Adventist mask. Um, but that's not what I wanted to talk about. I also want to say I admire her glasses. Yes. Those are, those are the coolest. <laughs> she she so, um, has uh, spectacular spectacles. Yes. <laughs> You know, our, our church is very, very bad at change. It's uh, very difficult to get things done because of our organizational structure and culture. And also because when you've got things right, how can you change? Um, so we tend to muddle along. And uh, right now, I think the subject we're talking about these uh, proposed 29th fundamental belief is an area where we will just muddle along. Um, but I think there is a de facto, uh, you can speak to Gino or Art Clem if you need a definition, a de facto number 29. Uh, I think that there has been for decades a quiet drift to variety. Uh, more or less quiet. Sometimes it's not quiet, sometimes it is. But for the average member in the pew, it's probably pretty quiet. Where, uh, where we drift to variety in the way we view the Adventist belief system. And I think it's happening all around us. It's happening right this minute. Um, has been for some time and will continue. So if we have a de facto 29, uh, where there is a drift to variety, where does that lead us? Um, well, probably it leads us to Sabbath school classes who are grouped by orientation. Uh, probably it leads to congregations by orientation. 
I drive by probably five Adventist churches to get to the one I'm comfortable with uh, because we're grouping by orientation. In some cases, particularly like Harry mentioned, he doesn't have any choice. Maybe we just get along by quiet forbearance where we don't talk about it. We just try to fellowship with each other. Uh, sometimes that may lead to clashes. We even have media by orientation. Uh, you wouldn't think that three ABN in this class were affiliated with the same church. Um, so where does that all go? What if, what if we uh, continue this quiet drift to variety uh, without anything formal happening, like adding a real number 29? Uh, will we split? Uh, or will we just evolve organically uh, toward uh, an internal bifurcation? And um, I just wonder where it's taking us uh, without something formal happening, which I doubt will happen. Right. And um, perhaps the best we can hope for is that all of us, regardless of our orientation about the belief system, need to find common ground. And uh, I suspect that common ground is somewhere close to uh, loving each other um, and uh, respecting each other and so on and forth or forth without uh, beating on the horse of the variety of belief systems that we have. Well, you make a good point. Uh, and I, I, think, I think there's a certain wisdom in just letting uh, regular organizational elasticity happen. Uh, and, and there's a great deal of that. Uh, the problem is that from time to time, uh, the elasticity fails and we erupt in conflict over one of those items, uh, such as happened with uh, Carol's gay son and uh, is happening with, with uh, a lot of different, well, we, we can list a lot of issues right now, uh, such as uh, the literal six day creation, fiat creation 6,000 years ago. As long as we could kind of adopt a, a sort of a comfortable flexibility, that's gonna work for us. Uh, so far, we get away with some elasticity, but we haven't really made that a, a feature of our personality. Am I right, Ed? If that's not a feature of our of our organizational personality, uh, but I like your idea, and uh, Ed, you're always you're always uh, wise. Thank you. I'm going to go to Ayanda, who's up next. Ayanda, can you join us, please? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, uh, hello, brother. How uh, are things in South Africa? Oh, we are, we are, we are, we are there. We are keeping the faith. Um, everything is okay. Thank you for asking. And you you are feeling uh, well. Yes, yes, I've got my shot, so um, I'm doing good. Uh, good. My next shot should be sometime in September. So yeah, I'm still gonna be around, I think. <laughs> <I'm>, we're, we, <laughs> we, are, we are thrilled to hear that, thank you. Yes, uh, what, one thing I've noticed, and from although I caught your lesson, but I read up throughout the week, so at least I had an idea what you were teaching. Um, one of the things that I've noticed with the Adventist church, uh, as much as I love it, is that one, it's an organization and institutions, they, they don't wanna admit two things, that they are wrong. They, it, it seems like it's a, it's like, uh, it's a, a cardinal sin to admit that you are wrong. And secondly, one of the things that we, and I've realized is that we've mixed things that should not have been mixed, like the baptizing people and making them believe the doctrines, because one of the things which are true is that even in the Adventist church, we don't all believe the same things. The fact that we all keep the Sabbath, it does not mean we believe doctrine number, the first doctrine about the Godhead. Some people don't even believe the Holy Spirit. So, so, so those are the things that we as an organization have failed. And that is why people are disgruntled with the church. It is because our theology 
it has almost become the empire theology that we are trying to preach against. We, we look at the Catholic Church and say, oh, they, 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 they preach from the top down and this is not right. And they, they, it's a woman sitting on the beast and what not, what not. But we also are sort of practicing the same things that if I have a problem with a, a certain doctrine, therefore I, I've fallen and that I should be castigated and I should be, you know, I'm, I'm already a rebel, whereas I should be engaged. So I think that's the problem with our church that we need to, uh, even sharing Ellen White, a third part, as I'm, we, 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 we are so scared in sharing Ellen White so that other churches can critique her and tell us where we are falling short. And we keep her amongst ourselves. And when, when, when some of us critique her writings, then it becomes a problem. So I think with our church, uh, there's so much good that we do but the small things that we fail to, to admit, it's actually becoming a problem. And we are becoming an empire. And in an empire, you have pimps and pastors that you pimp in order to preach the pimped out theology that believe in this. If you don't believe in this, you're going to hell. And if you don't preach it and you're just preaching Jesus Christ and him and him alone, then you have a problem. They say, oh, but what about Ellen White? You know, where do you stand on Ellen White? Now, my test of faith is no longer no if longer. I believe, you know. So, so that's where we are. And I think uh, these conversations are critical. They need to happen. And I hope we can create so that people can express themselves so that we are not hidden, but we are there and say, oh, we love the church, but we just want to see it do better. I thank you. Interesting. I'm gonna just go to George Tishy at this point. George, if you could share your thoughts with us. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. I hope you are, can hear me well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, very interesting meeting today, very crucial and very important. Um, I have been, let's say inside the church, but looking from the outside for many years. And uh, concerning to what was discussed today, I, I think that the parent's job can be used as an example. Those of you who are parents and already raised your kids, you didn't raise them to be submissive and uh, attached to you forever. We raise our, our kids to become mature, independent, and, and, and able to deal with life by themselves. I bring this into the church. The church for me is, it has the same, the same job, is to grow mature, spirit, spiritually mature Christians. What the Adventist Church has done is the opposite. It supports, uh, it is a system that keeps people under the lid and uh, not developing mature independent thinkers. And this is what has to be changed. So I think that uh, the new perspective, the, the, the 29, uh, Lauren, could be just this, we don't judge or persecute each others. Mm -hmm. That you eliminate immediately obstacles. We don't judge uh, what you think, what you believe, and what you say. We just, we are just a community that is trying to grow. And in this sense, I think that this seminar that you have is a, a, a classic example of freedom of thinking, freedom of expression, and where we can grow. I appreciate uh, these meetings and everything you do. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you, what you, you said uh, about what we, we, we could say as our 29th belief, uh, I, I, I helped Greg to craft it as, as we did. <laughs> Because uh, I wanted him, I wanted it to be clear that we were not just uh, rejecting, we were accepting. Uh, we, we wanted to make a clear statement that 
uh, as long as you behave as a Christian, you're part of our community. Uh, somebody else suggested an alternative. Oh, this is Dr. Hain. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hain. I, I'm going to grab your comment here and uh, use it. Uh, he said, I wish the church would go back to the original Seventh Avenue statement. This is promoted by my friend and uh, Professor Alden Thompson. And the original Adventist station statement was, li listen to this, how simple this is. I love this. We, the undersigned, hereby associate ourselves together as a church, taking the name Seventh-day Adventists, covenanting to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, that's about as, as basic as we need right there. We associate ourselves together as a church, taking the name Seventh Abbas, covenanted to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. I can, I can, uh, I love that. That's all I need. Carmen Seibold is up next. And Carmen, after you finish your comments, I'm going to ask if you would give our prayer, our 1230 prayer, and then we'll move into our, uh, our less formal discussion. Go ahead, Carmen. Okay. I just wanted, I guess, to get back to the proposed 29th belief and that perhaps we do need something like that because it seems to me that the, the apparent solution that paring down what are our required essential beliefs is still a real big challenge because it depends on how those essential beliefs are worded. And it is a challenge because I don't know any SDA belief that means the same thing to everyone. Just a couple of examples and on what could easily be agreed upon as to be core doctrines. Which definition of the Sabbath? A blessing and symbol of the salvation rest we have in Christ or the Sabbath as the traditional end time mark of God's saved followers versus all those apostate Christians out there. And others, even our belief in Jesus, is he our savior? Or is he our example, proving that we can and must be as perfect as he is to earn salvation? Those have literally been and continue to be contested interpretations, each claiming to be the true Adventist understanding. So maybe paring down would be a good idea, but it's not gonna get us out of hot water. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this discussion. We thank you that you love us, that you love us in our imperfect understandings and um, as we struggle, that you grant us responsibility that you grant us a free choice and that you promise that the Holy Spirit will teach us all things. Thank you for the discussion, but not just for now, but that you will go with us as we all seek to follow Jesus Christ a little better every day. And we thank you for the hope and in his name, amen. That thank was, you, Carmen. That was a really good comment. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciated mm -hmm. that. You, you all, you all uh, can envy me for having such an articulate partner. <laughs> I'm, we're at the 1230 mark. If anyone wishes to leave, this is the official uh, close of the service. But for those of you who are regulars, you know that we usually hang around for another 30 minutes. We have several hands that are up and I'm interested to hear what you have to say because it's a very provocative topic. I'm gonna ask Admiral N to unmute and uh, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself. There we go. Go Admiral, ahead and let us know what you have to say about the subject. This is, this is my friend, Admiral N. Uh, who is a wonderful writer. I, uh, uh, Admiral, I have, I have said so often to uh, my team what a blessing you have been to uh, to bring on board, and uh, so I'm just so glad to to listen to your voice. I don't know if we can see your face, but that's okay. One way or the other, I'm really pleased to have you here today. Go ahead. 
thank you, Lauren. Um, I, I don't trust my internet bandwidth, so let me not show my face for now, probably next time. Thank, thank you so much for the provocative discussion. I, I've learned a lot and I've appreciated the angle and the diversity of views that have just been coming through. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself whether we need a 29th fundamental belief at all. We, are we not going to fall into a trap of trying to, trying to, to just, you know, to, to perpetuate something that is already wrong within us and with the way we, we have come to define our identity. Um, my view is we need to go back and ask ourselves, how come, why, and how did we lose the fundamental beliefs from being a, a description of what we believe in to becoming a prescription? That's where we missed it. And the, the day we took some of them and put them in the baptismal vows, we now made it mandatory for somebody to believe before they believe. So defining what we believe in, we, we now require each other. They've become a prescription. You know, in my part of the world, I've had examples of there's a clause, I think, in the church manual that talks about denial of faith. And, and, and if, you, if you read that clause, it talks about denying the teachings of Jesus, of the gospel, and some of the fundamental beliefs. And that clause has, has been abused or misunderstood, misapplied, so that then we have tightened the noose, you know, on you have to believe before you belong. If you have your questions, keep them to yourselves, but publicly and everywhere you need to show that you're towing the line. So I think we need to go back and ask ourselves, I'm sure our pioneers from the history that you've just narrated, we're scared of where we are today, where now our identity is, is much more important than us making each other belong and coexisting despite our differences. So we have invested so much in being us over the years and it's haunting us now. It's haunting us, it's globally, even in our part of the world. It's, it's now, you know, once you bring in elements of religious exclusivism, once you talk about being remnant, already you, you become repulsive. You know, people cringe once you say we are the remnant. You know, so we need to go back and ask ourselves, yes, it's important for us to articulate what we believe in, but let's not make it prescriptive. Let's not require it upon one another as a, as a prerequisite of belonging. You know? Because at the end of the day, somebody summed it up. We need just to ask ourselves, if somebody's being converted to Adventism, what is it that is minimal? And the minimum thing is accepting Jesus as their savior. All these other things, it's a journey of learning and unlearning. So we really have to be honest. And I think the time for us to have that discussion over our identity is now. Thank you so much. Yeah, Admiral, I think, that, I think that distinction between description and prescription is a good one. And uh, I quite like it. Uh, and they're probably that'd be useful, probably as useful as, as what, uh, you know, when Greg and I put this together, we, we didn't do it uh, thinking that we were going to get a serious response from the church on it. We put it together to make people think about this issue of how much is, how much is uh, my responsibility and how much is the church's responsibility. Harry seemed to fall on the side of it's my responsibility. I need to to grow in grace and, and grow in understanding, and uh, come closer to, to to God and myself by 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 my uh, desire to do so. And, and and I'm really appreciative of that. But uh, something you said there, where you said you you have to believe before you can belong, and uh, that that's very good. Yes, I, I don't want a community. I, I, I think what we were trying to do in our statement was to say, no, you can belong without believing. Uh, that belonging is a, is a right, a privilege. 
I, I hope I hope that's the case. I hope I, I, I'm speaking for Greg here. He's he's uh, gone silent on me. In fact, I think he's left. Uh, so, but but we did work on the these concepts together. Last night in preparing for this seminar, I actually looked up the verse again about the remnant because that came up in the 27 or 28 fundamental beliefs. And it, you know, it talks about keeping the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was thinking about the commandments that Jesus gave about love the Lord God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Did they, do we consider those to be the commandments of God and loving your neighbor as yourself, I think is something we could all work on a little bit. I'm gonna to go to Jean and ask you to unmute yourself. Looks like you are. And if you could share your thoughts with us. You know, uh, before you before I, I get Jean on here, I wish I could get Olive Hemmings to comment on. She has written for us about those uh, texts on the uh, uh, Revelation twelve nineteen and and the identification of the church. Uh, maybe we, I see Olive is here, although she may not be. She sometimes uh, follows several classes at once. I don't know if we can get her, but she had her. She wrote for us in one of our magazines a very interesting explanation of that topic and i'd like to hear it yeah gene where are you okay i'm here can can you hear me i can indeed yes. where, where are you from gene i'm in canada Are so we should be calling you jean <laughs> yes but sorry I'll about accept, that i'll accept the english though <laughs> yeah so my name actually is jean hmm? mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for this great uh, seminar. This is, I think, a very needed topic. And Lauren, you put me up to it. You asked me to. <laughs> that was my that was my intention, my friend. I, I put you on the spot. <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, I I do agree with you that there is a need for a change, at least for 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 a twenty ninth fundamental belief. But I think the 28, the current 28 that we have need to be revised, updated, or even reduced uh, to what we have here. Because my main item on the chat room was uh, regarding uh, baptism and membership in the SDA church. When uh, I remember at least once I've been in evangelistic crusades and i remember at one time this lady who wanted to get baptized to be part of our church and the pastor refused to baptize her because she had an issue with uh, tobacco cigarette smoking and my turn of thought on this is that when pastors or leaders are telling people who want to come to Christ, to get baptized into Christ, that you cannot be baptized because you have uh, an alcohol issue or you have a tobacco issue. What if this person dies like the same day or the next day without accepting Christ and this person is lost? Now, isn't the church responsible or the, the, the pastors, the leaders, they're responsible for not allowing this person to be baptized into Christ, to accept Christ? I would like some thoughts from you, Lauren, or anybody else would like to uh, uh, respond to this. I feel that this is an issue within the, the 20th century. Um, is that people, they have to change first. We ask them to change first, to stop smoking or stop the drinking first before you come to Christ, when Christ is the one who does the changing. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, you know, this is, a, this is a really good thought, John. Uh, I, I, will, I will make a confession here. Uh, when I have had a few instances in my life where I had a person who I felt was truly converted, loved the Lord, wanted to be part of the church, wanted to belong, but they couldn't give up smoking. 
I, I confess now because they, they, they're probably not going to take me out and, and stone me at this point that I went ahead and baptized them. Hey, before, uh, I want to do something here before we go on to James. James, if you'll forgive me, I had asked Olive a question, and Olive is here. So, Olive, would you would you come on and uh, explain what you wrote about in that article? Could you remind me of the question, Lauren? Yeah, it, it, the article that you wrote to uh, Adventist to, for Adventist Today uh, two or month two months back, I think. Uh, you took on the question of uh, the identification passages in Revelation on uh, here's the patience of the saints here, they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, and then that the faith of Jesus is the testimony of Jesus. Yeah, the, well, uh, I was simply um, noting how uh, we inserted our own ad Adventist identity into a text that <laughs> didn't have Adventism in mind. Uh, and was actually referring to uh, the testimony of the early church, um, which is about the faith of Jesus, which or, or the word actually means faithfulness, um, which is directly related to the idea of justice. And the early church was really teaching what the covenant was about. It was about justice. It was about advocacy for those who are oppressed and marginalized. In the Roman Empire, that was a problem. And even in Judaism, it was a problem where you have the conflict within Judaism where those non-conforming <laughs> who were non-conforming, <laughs> um, like the Jesus followers that today has become a religion called Christianity. And so that was the whole situation that I was referring to. But like I said, we have inserted our own ident Adventist identity into that. And, and it really does not fit biblically. It, it what we be. must understand yes those identifications are actually mentioned a number of times in in the revelation yes the testimony of jesus christ and the faith of jesus that that is yes. not unique there it, yes the testimony really is the same as the faith of jesus uh, and the word faith there actually means the faithfulness of jesus that's what they were referring to that the, the, um the remember that, that we made said, the jump yes. that we made is to say that the testimony of jesus is Ellen White. Is Ellen White's writings. Right. And 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 so <laughs> and so we, we 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 have to go back and revisit that because you know just like Martin Luther inserted his, his own issues with Catholicism into Paul's writing on justification by faith, um, in the same way we insert <laughs> our own identity and spirit of prophecy <laughs> into a totally different uh, um, a setting a set of circumstances mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what we do we are always that's what we do with the biblical text we tend to come to it from where we are standing and yes we need to make it relevant but we have to make sure we first understand what it is referring to first and foremost in order for us to appropriately apply it to our context yes. and we can appropriately apply revelation 19 10 to our context if we really go in and see what's talking about because it's saying something quite profound which i think in our rush towards what i think is sometimes a rather narcissistic a sense of self-identity perhaps it can help us to move away from that and become a more mission focused uh, a, a church that is focused on, on bringing about and advocating for justice in the world that is really now hungering and thirsting for it. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think I think what we're saying here is that it's still a, a profoundly important and relevant passage to all Christians. It's just not identifying fourth commandment keepers and Ellen White necessarily. Yes. I'm going to go to James B. Croft and just remind everyone, we have four hands raised and we have about 11 minutes left. Mm -hmm. So just budget your time. James, go ahead. Yes. Brevity is important. We can go on and on and on. And editing is important. I've heard some really wonderful comments on here and a lot of wisdom. My thinking was that we basically need to do some reformation re-education of ourselves and re-editing as a, as a movement. We need to go back to what Hain was speaking to in the, uh, in the simplicity of the whole thing. You know, that basically Jesus, Jesus's message was love, love God and love your, 
neighbors and don't go on and on about it and just get to work and let's let's heal people and so i guess my thinking is we need to just use this 29th or whatever and make it right up front or better yet we need to edit that 28th and cut it cut them right out and go to some very simple statement like Dr. Hain was speaking of. And so that's all I, have. brevity is important and we're not very good at it as Adventists. We, we just go on and on and on and on and pile it up and, and build the common law and et cetera. And I could just joke and keep on talking here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, no, you're right. The, the, uh, the, the statement that Alden Thompson advocates is so simple and to the point. Uh, we covenant together to keep the commandments of God and have faith in Jesus. Uh, well, what more do you need really? I'm going to ask, I'm going to go to Frank out of order just because he hasn't spoken yet and ask him to unmute him, his uh, speakers there and share his thoughts with us. Frank. Okay. Let me get my video on as well. Is, is this uh, yes, this is uh, my, my friend, Frank Marandino. How are you, Frank? All right. How are you, Lauren? Yeah. I, I, I just had two brief thoughts and one was um, that when we're talking about, well, what, what is, what qualifies for belonging? I mean, I just look at the New Testament and what do you see all over the New Testament? It was, you know, um, people are justified, Paul is saying. Another way, way of saying you belong to the covenant God and his people mm -hmm. through, the, through faith in Jesus or allegiance to Jesus and not by the deeds of the law. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, and Adventism has, we, just by our name, we define ourselves by one of the deeds of the law. And you, you compare that with the idea of, Paul was saying, we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Well, law kind of lends itself to written code. That's what we have, 28 fundamental beliefs that are a written code. And, um, and it produces all kinds of problems. And that leads me to the second thing, and that is I'm a teacher, I'm a music teacher. And they always tell teachers, keep your classroom rules at a minimum. No more than three, very simple, not 28. <laughs> three to show this is how our classroom rolls and this is what it means to belong to our classroom and function in here. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thanks much, Frank. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to coming back and visiting with you all as soon as we're, we're safe to do that. Steve keeps inviting me and, and we will sometime. Sherry Ann, I'm asking you to unmute if you could uh, rejoin us. Yes, thanks. Thanks so much, Gina. So my quick question um, that I want to ask is with, relate, with regards to um, something that was shared with me where a, a pastor had some interesting thoughts on tithing um, and he had done a voice note that had been circulated and there are a number of persons who were like, you know, they're, they're not interested in hearing what he has to say. They're not concerned with this new light um, that he has and they, they want, you know, the, the old, old story is, is how one person described it. You know, that's what they, they want to hear. Um, but how do we get persons to really understand what present truth really meant? That's my question. Mm, that's, wow, that's, that's a profound question. What does it mean to have present truth? And, and uh, I, I think a lot of us think we have present truth. I, I, I have friends who are, uh, who are uh, very much uh, supporters of the notion that uh, vaccines are the mark of the beast. I have friends who are very much supporters of the notion that the election was stolen from their favorite candidate. And they bond this all together with this sort of time of the end thing. And you could say, well, is that present truth? Well, it's certain, certainly contemporary, uh, contemporary uh, interpretations. Uh, part of present truth is not just that it's contemporary, though, but that it's true. And uh, some of these things simply are not true. So uh, what is present truth? And, and here again, I don't know quite how to work with this, Cherry Ann, and, and, and I'm not sure that, that any of us do. Uh, I, I, would love to, I would love to visit s more churches overseas, like in Barbados or Jamaica, and find out how people struggle with 
this notion of what is true for them there. And uh, Terry Ann, maybe someday we'll have that chance. You know, I think there's something to understanding the mind of God. And I think we're all rather presumptuous if we think we can understand the mind of God. And for us to claim that we have God's 100% truth, I just don't think that's realistic. But if you're a church that believes you have the truth with two capital T's, someone made the comment earlier that the church has difficulty saying that it's wrong. Maybe that's why. Harry Banks, you're going to be our last uh, participant today. So bring us home with your thoughts here. Thank well, you. thinking, speaking about thinking that we know uh, what God's supposed to be doing. I often complained in my Sabbath school class that I put in my application for master of the universe and it kept being denied. And I would repeatedly turn it in for three applications or sometimes 12 applications and it kept being denied. And one day the class walked in and handed me an envelope and I opened it up and there was a certificate of master of the universe indeed. And except they said, you've got to read the fine print. And when I read the fine print, it said not valid in heaven or on earth, <laughs> which made me wonder where it was valid. But anyway, uh, so uh, uh, Lauren had asked me to kind of comment about um, an item that I put in the notes. And I, I guess when I, where I'm kind of coming down on this is I think there's just two problems. The problem isn't with the statements as such. I mean, you have the Westminster Creed, you have all these other creeds, they've stood good time, you know, they've made contributions to uh, Christian thought. I think the problem is a two-part one. One that we've correctly identified, I think, here is the way the people make it prescriptive. Mm -hmm. The other part is uh, trying to understand our appropriate response to those uh, statements. And I think if we can gain a personal strength and be able to look at those as points of discussion, look at them as points of uh, structure for the organization, uh, they can stand. They don't need to be modified. They don't need to be adapted. The issue is really more with our ability to understand our appropriate response to them. Um, and I think that's, that's learning how to be uh, strong in Christ. And uh, we, don't need, uh, we don't need somebody to authorize that. Thank you, Harry. And I think that something that is um, really necessary for a church to grow is for others to be encouragers. I don't think any of us want conflict. I, I had an uncle that used to go, he would call it argue about religion. It's like, who wants to argue about religion? Can you encourage others in the Christian walk? I think people would be more receptive to that. And I just wanna thank Lauren for the presentation today and thank all the people who are here today. You're all important to me. This is a church community to me. I feel supported. I hope that you all do too and feel the freedom to put your thoughts out there and just get feedback and start reframing things that you've thought about for years. And, and I hope you feel the freedom to uh, express your thoughts without judgment. But we all learn from each other in our Christian walk. And I think that's part of the encouragement of the body of Christ. Uh, Jack Hain wrote a nice little note here, and I, I, I'd like Jack to say it, but I'll go ahead and say it since he's not unmuting himself. He says, present truth is an explanation of why we can change our understanding of what is true. It means that all understand is sub understanding is subject to improvement and correction. It means we accept we can be wrong or partial in what we think. It does not mean truth changes, it means, means that we can change in how we interpret what is true. And uh, Jack, I, I, I'd still like you to say, to say this, but I'll just add that for me, um, one of the reasons that I wrote the article as I did uh, was, was to say that truth is not, what we can understand as individual, not prescriptive from the top not demanded from the top. It's individual, it's personal. Uh, and I, as Cherry Ann said, uh, 
I'd, uh, I, I've come to the point where I'm going to be who I am and do what I believe and not be a hypocrite about it. Uh, but at the same time, I've talked to Cherry Ann enough to know that, that it's also a struggle to know how to stay with her community and feel those things. So it, it's probably not enough to just say, well, kind of craft your own religion. Uh, I, I, sometimes, I sometimes feel sad that so often in our discussions, we do end up feeling like we're fighting against the, the church out there. But uh, at the same time, uh, it, it's still, it's such a part of our world that I'm not sure we can just say, yeah, we're going on without you. Uh, so anyway, hey, thank you all very much. It's 3.59 and uh, I, I loved having all, I'm, I'm with, uh, with Gina here. I really appreciate this group. The ones we know every week and the ones who, who show up later, a uh, wonderful group of people. Um, and uh, Jack, said, Jack says the GSC is not the church. We, we don't fight the church, we fight its abusers. Okay. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.